I'll call the meeting to order of the Senate State Government Finance and Policy and Elections Committee. Today being Monday, April 4th, 2022. Welcome everybody. Um, this is the day we get to have the uh, major state government uh, bill, omnibus bill, ready to um, head out of this committee. I so appreciate everybody's uh, input. We've had a lot of hearings had a lot of testimony already. We'll hear some more today as well. We will be adjourning though by 4.15. There are other meetings going on today, so uh, just let yourself know that so you kind of uh, temper your comments uh, to consideration for others who are testifying so that everybody will have an opportunity to get some time. Um, with that, we're going to start with our agenda today, and the first bill on the agenda is Senator Housley with Senate File 4209. I'll move that. Senator Housley, welcome again to the committee. Glad to have you here today. And um, if you want to do your, um, okay, if you want to present your bill, just go ahead and say so. And and uh, state your name and so on and so forth, the audio record, and then we'll go to your testifiers. But you do have an amendment, is that right? Yes, Madam Chair, I have the A3 amendment. Okay, is this your first? Madam Chair and members, um, the amendment um, makes some changes that will harmonize the bill with the version moving along in the House. Um, the amendment on lines 1.2 to 1.3 um, provide that data, it's a it narrows the scope of the app of the provision data from juvenile court proceedings um, is maintained as is classified as private data and and this change on lines 1.2 to 1.3 specify that it is uh, the data that do not pertain to juveniles certified as adults then the changes on lines 1.4 to 1.6 add another member to the um, Board of Foster Youth Ombudsperson. Uh, and then one person is one guardian ad litem who is currently appointed to protect the interests of minors in cases in the juvenile court system. And the changes on 1.7 and 1.8 are just technical. Lines 1.9 to 1.11 provide that the Commissioner of Administration has to provide administrative services to the Office of Foster Youth Ombuds Person. Um, lines 1.12 through 1.16 make changes to the appropriation in the bill. Specifically, it increases the amount from 650 to 775, um, directs that the appropriation goes to the Office of the Foster Youth Ombuds Person instead of the Governor's Office and then sets the base appropriation for 2024 and 2025. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Change. Members, um, any questions? I'm seeing none. Uh, Senator Fateh. Hey, Madam Chair, I don't think there's any sound uh, for the folks listening on Zoom. Senator Fateh. The, page, the laptop was muted, the page is fixing it Okay, uh, pages are fixing some sound issue. We should be good now. All right, okay, very good. So, any questions about this amendment, the A3 amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor of the A3 amendment to Senate File 4209, please say aye. 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 Opposed, motion prevails. Senator Housley, to your bill as amended. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Senate File 4209 is speaking to the important issue of ensuring that the children in our state's foster care are protected and served just as well as the children in our own home. This bill would create an ombudsperson office and aims to provide oversight for the systems that are tasked with protecting Minnesota's children from harm and to create a vehicle that can adequately track the issues affecting young people in Minnesota. This is needed because fosters do not have a resource or an avenue for intervention when they are being abused or neglected at the hands of our own child protection system. As it stands, there are no organizations or entities that track complaints or common concerns that arise for fosters. 
Without this data, we are left powerless to affect meaningful changes in our existing structures. By establishing an ombudsperson office for fosters, we are creating an organizational structure that will create positive change, allow for more capacity to do independent investigations, and track areas where significant intervention is needed. Um, I'm going to turn it over to my testifier, Wong Murphy, um, to continue. Mr. Murphy, welcome to the committee. Glad to have you here today. You state your name and uh, who you represent, or if you're on behalf of yourself, and then proceed with your testimony. Mr. Murphy. Thank you, Chair. My name is Wong Murphy, and I am the founder and the executive director of a nonprofit called Foster Advocates. When families are not safe or good places for children to be, the government intervenes. Who intervenes when it is the government that is causing the harm. This begs just a really basic question. Who is watching the watchers? Currently, no one. Children entrusted to our care must face the challenges of life on their own upon aging out. They shouldn't have to face the foster care system alone with no one to call for help. And it doesn't have to be this way. We can do better by our young people. We must do better. Creating more opportunity for the Ombuds Office to lead meaningful change and improve systems issues plaguing the child welfare system in our state. This will have a trickle down effect for the state's child welfare system by anticipating and fixing issues before they arise that might lead to endangerment of a foster youth, as well as curbing any potential lawsuits from young people who might have been harmed. These are our children. They became ours when we separated them from their families. We owe them a duty of care just as strongly as we might for the children in our own homes. The fundamental truth is children are children and they should have a basic expectation that adults will take care of them. But I've seen personally and now at the systems level that this is not happening. It is my sincerest hope that all of you who are in positions of power reflect deeply on our moral responsibility and the cost of our continued indifference. So I'm asking that you all support 4209. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Murphy. Um, members, um, OK, we have a full agenda. I will just say that the purpose of foster care is to remove children from harm. That's the whole point. When they're moved from harm into harm, Absolutely, this is what you need. You've got to have this. You've got to have somebody who is there as an advocate for them when they are put in harm's way by the very system. And it's really heartbreaking um, as I've received the information in regards to some of these situations. But let's remember there are many, many foster parents who have given exemplary care and kindness and done the right thing by the foster children placed in their care. But when it does go wrong, it's really bad. And they're extremely vulnerable and in a tough situation. Where do they turn to? And so I'm glad to see that for those that are in that situation, that there will be an advocate as an ombudsperson. Thank you, Senator Housley, for bringing forward the bill. With that member, seeing no further discussion, um, I will move Senate File 4209, as amended, be recommended to pass and to be referred to the Finance Committee. On that motion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Thank you, Madam Chair, very much. Thank you, Senator Housley. Members, I'm going to move Senator Osmick. Um, So members, just to set your expectations, we're going to be 
uh, having Senator Kiffmeyer present the bill, uh, listening to testimony today. Questions will be uh, tomorrow. Um, the first four individuals are commissioners or bet or higher, um, so I won't necessarily restrict them. However, we do have a timeline. Uh, we will be adjourning at quarter after four. So uh, just keep that in mind for all testifiers. Um, if you testified before, certainly you can amplify what you've said before, but keep in mind we, uh, we do have a timeline here. So to Senate File 3975, Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and members. Glad to be before you today. This has been uh, several months of hearings and testimony, bills, a variety of inputs, letters, informational bulletins, a variety of things that have come before this committee. And so I bring forth the bill that we have today. Uh, in particular, my budget uh, was $10 million and it was specified to be used for uh, in the election area, and so I've complied with that request, and so that's the bill that you have before you today. But there are several other uh, areas in this bill um, that I will ask Ms. James and Mr. Erickson to go over and to come uh, go over some of those details that are in the bill, several other very, very important things that we've included in the bill today. Uh, so who wants to go first? Mr. Erickson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'll, I'll briefly walk through the, the spreadsheet that you all have in front of you. It's time stamped uh, April 1st at 3.59 p.m. Uh, it's a fairly simple spreadsheet. You can see the white columns are all of the uh, spending in the current biennium. The green columns are the tails columns. Uh, along the left, you'll see the appropriations. Uh, and these include, for the Secretary of State, $6 million in election grants uh, with some specifications that I'll get to in a moment. There's also a $1 million annual reduction in an ongoing Dropbox uh, grants program that's currently uh, being administered by the Secretary of State. There's also $4 million for minute services uh, to do some activity related to live streaming requirements that are in the bill. Uh, and the tail for this drops to $1 million in each year uh, to, to keep in, uh, in line with the committee's tails target. Finally, there is a revenue change that you can see on, it's uh, labeled line 105, related to uh, some changes at, with the Board of Cosmetology. Specifically, there are some new uh, hair technicians uh, who are being licensed, and that will bring in revenue of approximately 24,000 starting in fiscal 24 and 19,000 in fiscal 25. Uh, that keeps to the, the good side of the committee's target, and so you can see the um, negative cost to the committee's target along the, the bottom line in the tails. Um, these appropriations and changes are enabled in Article 1 of the bill. You can see in Section 2 on page 1 some of the, uh, the permitted uses of the election money that I described a moment ago. Um, the permitted uses are to either hire temporary staff to help enter voter registration applications into the SVRS to comply with the live streaming requirements that I gestured at uh, with respect to minute. And finally, to purchase ballot paper that conforms to security marking requirements that are in the bill. Uh, that's all uh, that I have on the appropriations, Mr. Chair. Ms. James. Mr. Chair and members, I'll start with uh, describing the bill from Article 2. Um, this is on page 2. Um, section 1 of Article 2 is from Senator Kiffmeyer's LCC bill. This authorizes the executive director of the Legislative Coordinating Commission to enter into contracts on behalf of the House and the Senate and the joint offices. Um, a contract for professional or technical services that's in excess of $50,000 um, has to be approved um, by the chair and vice chair of the commission, though. Section 2 on page 3, performance of legal services. This is from Senator Kiffmeyer's bill, Senate file 2818. This adds constraints on the Attorney General's use of staff. Uh, uh, Ms. James, just one second. Uh, members, we're working on the actual delete all A1. Uh, she's been doing a presentation on the A1 amendment. We haven't moved that yet, but uh, that's where we're going. The original is in your packet, but we're working off a presentation on the A1. Ms. James. Mr. Chair, members, section three is on page three. This is from the LCC bill. This precludes an employee of the executive or judicial branch from serving on the legislative salary council. 
section four is on page four. Uh, also from the LCC bill, this modifies and clarifies the timing for appointment to the Legislative Salary Council. Section five, also from the LCC bill, this eliminates obsolete language. Section six is, is on page five. Section six and section seven are from Senator House bills, Senate file 3157. This eliminates the requirement for an analysis of the cost of on-site production of renewable energy. Um, all state agency projects, as well as capital projects funded with bond proceeds would be subject to this change. Page six, sections eight and nine are from Senate file 4359, Senator Benson's bill. This adds requirements and constraints for um, state grants to tax exempt non-governmental organizations. And that takes us to page nine, section 10. Um, this is Senate, Senator Rest's bill, Senate file 2959. It expands eligibility for cities and counties to be able to make certain investments. On the next page, page 10, section 12, is from Senator Utke's bill, Senate file 4214. This authorizes self-insurance pools to invest funds in authorized investments of the State Board of Investment. Near the bottom of page 10, section 13 is also from the LCC bill. It adds requirements for the governor's consideration in making appointments to the Board of Trustees for Minnesota State Colleges and University. On page 11, section 14, um, sections 14 through 33 are from Senator Kiff Meyer's bill, Senate file 4065. These make a number of changes to the Board of Cosmetologist Examiner statutes. These include adding a license for hair technicians, as Mr. Erickson mentioned. It pushes the licensing term for the licenses issued by the board from three years to four years. It adds four members to the Board of Cosmetologist Examiners. Um, it provides reciprocity for registered barbers towards licensure with the Board of Cosmetology. Um, it makes technical and conforming and clarifying changes. It adds the ability for schools to offer field trips. And then in a later section near the end, um, there will be a, an instruction to the reviser to change the name of the board to the Board of Cosmetologists. And that takes us to page 20, section 34. This is from the LCC bill. It staggers the terms of the members of the Mississippi River Parkway Commission. The next section is on page 21, section 35. This is from <coughs> Senator Duckworth's bill, Senate file 2950. This authorizes the use of money in the Breeders Fund for, the, for horse racing to be used to support race, tr racehorse adoption, retirement, and repurposing. Page 22, section 36 is from Senator Limmer's bill um, as amended by the committee. And, and I should have mentioned that in all the bills that are included here, um, the amendments that were adopted in the committee have been included, incorporated. So section 36, the uh, amended provision extends the advisory committee on the capital area security to 2036 from 2022. Section 37 on page 22 is Senator Coran's bill, Senate file 3251. This authorizes the Board of Accountancy to reinstate an expired license in the same way that they are able to um, reinstate a suspended, revoked, or surrendered license. Page 23, section 38, is Senator Housley's bill, um, Senate file 2862. Um, this is sections 38, 39, and 40 from that bill. Precludes the Gambling Control Board from enforcing new rules regarding e-pull tab devices, games, and systems if they met rules at the time that they were introduced or approved. Um, but if, if a new rule does not allow those games, that rule is not applied to prevent the use of those unless a law is enacted to make those rules applicable to the, new, to the old games, systems, um, and devices. On page 24, um, section 41 is from Senator Kiffmeyer's 
Board of Cosmetology bill. This creates a licensing working group that will study several aspects of the licensure um, under the Board of Cosmetologist Examiners. That takes us to section 42, which is on page 26. Uh, this is another piece of the puzzle for staggering the terms of the Mississippi River Parkway Commission. This is from the LCC bill. Section 43 on page 26 is from Senator Duckworth's bill 3407. It directs the Amateur Sports Commission to study and report to the legislature about the prospects of building an amateur sports center in Dakota County. On page 27, section 44, is Senator Bach's bill, Senate File 4072, that authorizes the IRRR to offer separation and retention programs for employees of the um, Iron Range Resources and, Re and Rehabilitation Department. On page, at the bottom of page 27, section 45, is a, a chair's initiative. This is an alternative approach to Senator Johnson Stewart's bill regarding um, public land survey monuments. Um, these are the monuments that are located at the corners um, that mark public land segments. Um, and, the, and this provides for the chief geospatial information officer to um, collect from the county's information about the amount of work that would be needed to renovate or to restore those monuments, um, including how much it would cost and whether or not the counties have instituted um, their taxing authority to pay for that work. Section 46 on page 28 is a revisor instruction, as I mentioned before, to change the name of the Board of Cosmetologist Examiners. Section 47 has two repealers in it. The first is the Candidate Advisory Council for the Board of Trustees for Minnesota State Colleges and Universities. And the second provision, 326A.04, is a repeal of an obsolete provision for the Board of Accountancy. And that is it for Article 2. Mr. Chair, I'll do Article 3. Please proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Article 3 is the Elections and Campaign Finance Article. Starting on page 28, section 1 is the beginning of a series of sections that changes the registration threshold from 750 to 200. You notice the effective date changed to be effective immediately, um, which is a change from when the committee heard the bill the first time. Uh, that takes us, those sections carry us through to page 31, section 6. This is a section um, of a similar concept to Senator Port's bill, but a bit different approach. And this has to do with um, making contributions from membership or access to an organization. And you'll see the operative language is on page 31, line 17 through 20, um, and talks about contributions made by lobbyists, political committees, or political funds um, for, act, for membership to or access in a facility during the regular legislative session if that facility is operated by those folks. Section 7 starts a series of sections about voter registration data. Uh, and there were some changes made to this section, I believe, in civil law. Those have been picked up in this version. Section 7 adds a cross-reference in the Data Practices Act. Section 8 is a section that classifies all data in the SVRS as public, with a few exceptions. And then it consolidates various provisions elsewhere in law into one section. So you'll see some stricken language and some repeal language that appears substantively in this section. Section 9 is one of those sections where language is stricken and a cross-reference is inserted to Section 8. Section 10 on page 33 is another one of those conforming changes where language is deleted but appears again in Section 8. Section 11 um, specifies that a person can ask for, make a data practices request for voter data. They're not limited just to the public information list. Section 12 does a couple of things. It requires entry of election day voter registration before the canvas for the election and requires the Secretary of State to electronically send voter registration cards to the counties. That takes us to page 35. Um, and there are several sections throughout the bill that make some cleanup changes to how absentee ballot envelopes are referred over the years. Improper names have been inserted or not changed or those sorts of things. So there are several provisions cleaning those up. Sections 13 and 14 are both envelope provisions, as is section 15. On page 36, section 16 allows a person to 
personally deliver their absentee ballot to the office of the county auditor or municipal clerk and prohibits the use of a drop box if you're dro dropping off somebody else's ballot. On page 37, section 17, make some changes to in-person absentee polling places. Section 18 is a provision about drop boxes for absentee voter absentee ballots. That takes us on top of page 38. You'll see some new requirements. I shouldn't say new requirements. These are what the committee had heard. Requirements for the drop boxes. Um, Going on to page 39, you'll see that there's a log and report, and rulemaking is prohibited by the Secretary of State. On page 40, it prohibits absentee ballot boards from using deputy county, county auditors or deputy city clerks unless they have also been appointed as an election judge. Section 20 is the first of a few sections that require security markings on um, absentee ballots. Section 21. Uh, make some changes about disclosure of vote totals that cross-references a section coming up in a few sections. Section 22 uh, establishes ballot board observers, um, and there have been a few changes um, after some discussions with between Senator Kiffmeyer and some other folks about who these people are and exactly what they can do. Uh, for the sake of time, I think that one of the main changes is um, there's a provision that allowed them to make challenges, and that does not appear here anymore. Uh, section 23 on page 43 um, requires live streaming of all ballot board activities for the duration of the absentee voting period. On page 44, there are some additional live streaming requirements. Uh, and this is a section that requires um, Minute to take care of all of the live streaming um, and stream it off the department's website and then make recordings of that data and make it available to the public. And there's some provisions about what happens if there's a disruption to the live stream um, and when activities can resume. Section 25 and 26 on page 45 are envelope cleanup provisions, as is section 27 on page 46, section 28 on 47, section 29 on page 48 prohibits locals from accepting contributions from businesses or nonprofits for election purposes. Section 30 is another security marking section. Section 31 makes some changes to the disclosure of election results, and this is a section I referenced earlier. Section 32 is a chair's initiative section, and this has to do with changes to publishing sample ballots. Um, under the language in the bill now, uh, they will publish a generic ballot that only includes races and candidates that appear on the ballot for every precinct in the county with additional information on how to find specific information for an individual voter. On page 50, section 33 is another uh, chair's initiative section and it requires the Secretary of State to establish a state contract um, for ballot paper with security markings. Section 34 on page 51 is the um, notice of public accuracy test changes, and you'll see a, a bit of a difference on lines 27 through 29. Instead of providing notice directly to the political party chairs, notice is given to the Secretary of State who posts it on the Secretary of State's website. On page 52, section 35, this is the bill about um, how sample ballots and absentee ballot applications must be labeled and formatted when they're sent out to voters. Um, and this is those ballots and applications that are not sent by the government, but any sort of other non-government entity. Section 36 on the top of page 53 requires the Secretary, the Secretary of State to submit a report, a couple of reports on how they've been spending some of the election appropriations. Section 37 repeals some provisions related to voter data that was replaced in the earlier section. Um, and then there's a general effective date of July 1st. Um, and I will say that the effective dates sort of range between um, immediate and then it going into effect September 1st. So they're effective for the general, but not the primary. And those sort of are scattered throughout. And that is the bill, Mr. Chair. So Senator Kiffmeyer, the A1 amendment is an author's amendment? I do not have an author's amendment today. No, this is the author's amendment. Yes, oh yes, yes, Mr. Chair. So Senator Kiffmeyer moves the A1 amendment. This is an author's amendment get to get the bill in shape uh, she wishes to have it for presentation. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, motion does prevail. Senator Kiffmeyer, any additional words before we go to testifiers? No, Mr. Chair, I prefer to just go to testifiers and maximize their time. Um, testifiers, we have 45 minutes. We'll begin on the list with Nicole Freeman, Secretary of State. 
which will be followed by Attorney General Keith Ellison and then Commissioner Alice Roberts. Ms. Freeman, please introduce, introduce yourself for the record, begin your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, my name is Nicole Freeman, Government Relations Director for the Office of Secretary of State. Um, today we're here to share uh, some concerns um, about this bill um, and the DE amendment. Um, the office will submit a letter uh, to the committee with our full testimony in the interest of time. So just a couple comments today. Um, so our concerns really fall into three categories. Uh, first, sections of the bill um, provide logistical challenges for local administrators, um, as well as other provisions uh, do remove flexibility that uh, local administrators currently have to administer elections in the manner that works best for their voters. And that our second concern uh, is around voter privacy. Uh, both related to live streaming voters and ballot boards, as well as changing um, the voter data classification in the state voter registration system. Um, finally, we understand that the motivation um, in a number of these sections is to increase transparency. Um, however, we believe that we should look for other ways to let the public further into our voting process by taking advantage of the ways that uh, we uh, the public can already observe um, the rigorous checks and balances that are built into our system already today. So that concludes my testimony, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Freeman. Next on the list, Attorney General Keith Ellison, please unmute yourself, introduce, introduce yourself for our committee, and begin your testimony. Mr. Chair. Um, Commissioner, just, I'm sorry, Attorney General. Hold on a second. We're having a we're having a hearing problem here. It's coming through the laptop, Mr. Chair, but not through the feed. Yeah, we, it's it's coming through your laptop, but not coming through our speakers here. I don't think it's. Hold for now. We're having some technical difficulties. I just and we know. certainly want to hear what you have to say. Okay, let's try it now. Uh, Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, all members. On behalf of all Minnesotans concerned about crime, including victims and their families and impacted communities, please reconsider your decision to zero out my office's request for funding to prosecute crime and retain talented staff in the Attorney General's office. This omnibus bill simply is not meeting the needs of Minnesotans at this critical moment. This moment, when crime is spiking, should be a moment of bipartisan unity. Someone who has lost a loved one to a violent crime does not care about the party affiliation of any of us. And I believe that it's our, our duty to fund the needs to provide public safety for all. I've asked this committee in 2019 2021, and now again in 2022 for funding to add prosecutors to the criminal division. I made this request for the first time long before the recent spike in violent crime. Yet once again, this request to assist local prosecutors to help uh, uh, deal with crime and crime victims is being ignored. The public deserves to know why. I will tell you again what I have said twice this year already and several times over the past three years. 25 years ago, the criminal division had 12 full-time prosecutors who prosecuted serious crimes in Minnesota when previous administrations significantly reduced the resources for the criminal division. It cut into the level of service that we provide to county attorneys and our ability to respond to their request to the overall detriment of public safety, in my opinion. When I became Attorney General three years ago, the division had only one full-time prosecutor. We have since uh, used existing resources to add two more full-time prosecutors since then to meet the need as well as we could. In just these past three years, this small but mighty unit has investigated and made charging decisions about and prosecuted 33 cases of murder, manslaughter, vehicular homicide, criminal sexual assault with outstanding results. 18 of the 20 counties where criminal division has handled these cases are in greater Minnesota. In the House Public Safety Committee last week, 
Representative O'Neill expressed her gratitude to the Clearwater County attorney for the conviction and sentencing of a criminal who tragically murdered a friend of hers. The Clearwater County attorney, Norsbach, pointed out that this result was enabled by the assistance and support that her office received from the criminal division of the attorney general's office. Our county attorneys, who are our frontline prosecutors in violent crime, are asking this committee for this help, as they have for the last several years. They are asking this committee to help rebuild the capacity of the attorney general's office to help them prosecute violent crime in complex cases. This committee already knows this because each member has received an oral and written testimony from county attorneys around Minnesota in strong support of this request. Finally, I believe this omnibus bill contains unconstitutional language. The attorney general is a constitutional officer, separately elected and therefore independent. This is in our constitution. The attorney general has discretionary power over the conduct of litigation and another branch of government cannot, quote, control the discretionary power of the attorney general in conducting litigation for the state. That is from Minnesota Supreme Court case law. The Constitution lays out a separation of powers. The legislature cannot undermine the work of the attorney general or any other constitutional office. Therefore, Article 2, Section 2 of the Omnibus, Omnibus Bill should be removed. I am submitting for the public record the February 18th letter I sent that debunks the premise of this unconstitutional proposal. In conclusion, I respectfully request that you reconsider your decision to zero out our request to help county prosecutors in Minnesota fight and prosecute violent crime. I ask you to restore the funding that we requested at the, at the amount of four point one five six million dollars. We must all do this and do anything we can to address the concerns that Minnesotans have about public safety. This includes this committee. The Attorney General's office has repeatedly done its part and stands ready to do more. And I'm asking everyone on this committee to help us. I yield back. Thank you, Attorney General. Next on the list is Commissioner Alice Ro uh, Roberts Davis, followed by Commissioner Showalter. Commissioner, please introduce yourself for the record, begin your testimony. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Chair Kiffmeyer, committee members, for the record, I am Alice Roberts Davis. I'm the Commissioner of the Department of Administration. Thank you for the opportunity to share comments on Senate File 3975. I am disappointed that additional investments to improve services to state agencies were not included in the Omnibus State Government Supplemental Budget Bill. A record budget surplus offers an opportunity to invest in state government to ensure that agencies have the support they need to best serve Minnesotans. Admin has a wide range of a wide ranging set of responsibilities that ultimately touch every part of state government, and our proposed budget changes reflect our efforts to increase capacity for improved services to our state agency partners. Specifically, funding for the Procurement Technical Assistance Center, Small Agency Resource Team, Fleet Fund, Office of Collaboration and Dispute Resolution, implementing an update to the Private Cemeteries Act, and covering enterprise COVID-19 workers' compensation claim costs are critical. Fully funding the 35% state match to the U.S. Department of Defense funds for the Procurement Technical Assistance Center, or PTAC, is imperative. PTAC offers free counseling, education, training, and guidance for all Minnesota businesses who wish to sell their products and services to local, state, and federal governments. The state's current use of staff time from the Office of State Procurement is not a sustainable solution. Adequately funding the state's match would also support greater statewide coverage by PTAC customers, or counselors, excuse me, who live throughout the state and work directly with state businesses. Small agencies don't have the staff or capacity to provide human resources or financial services, so they rely on admin's small agency resource team or SMART to provide those services. Since 2019, 
the number of smart partners served by admins, human resources, and financial management divisions has doubled from 19 to 38 partners. Admin's proposal funds a study to assess services delivered and ensure small agencies receive the support that they need in the most effective manner. It also enhances admin operations in the areas of staff retention and accounting services. The Office of Collaboration and Dispute Resolution, or OCDR, uses collaborative processes, public engagement, and the science of human relations to help government and stakeholders develop wise and durable solutions to seemingly intractable issues. OCDR currently receives more requests for services than the office can accommodate, and the volume of requests steadily increases each year. Admin proposes increase would support additional capacity to help OCDR meet the demand for services from state agencies, local governments, and the legislature. Admin's Fleet Services Division is experiencing temporary changes in fleet usage and sales cycles due to increased telework and global supply issues. This will result in admin collecting lower revenues than necessary to fund operating expenses. Admin's request stabilizes the fund while we continue improving the fleet with lower life cycle costs and greater fuel efficiency. It is also important to implement an update to the Private Cemeteries Act, which would modernize terminology, clarify authority over cemetery assessments, and codify federal law. These changes would also codify the authority of the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council over condition assessments of cemeteries deemed to be American Indian. Executing these updates will require additional capacity in the Office of the State Archaeologist to coordinate this work. Additionally, it is important to cover the costs related to the passage of Chapter 32 earlier this session, which extended the presumption that certain occupations were infected with COVID-19 on the job. Providing for funding upfront allows admin's risk management division to pay claims directly for agencies, simplifies the claim processing, and limits the number of transactions required. Admin's other budget requests strive to support enhanced state government services that will better serve Minnesotans, and these include studying disparities in state procurement, improving grants administration oversight, eliminating the fee to request open meeting law advisory opinions and streamlining data practices challenge appeals, and offering enterprise translation services. I'd also like to make another pitch to include our policy proposals. These are good governance measures with no physical, fiscal impact that help admin assist the enterprise. The technical and policy changes in Senate File 3729 will help admin streamline our work and correct obsolete statutes. Enhancing the state's small business program for certified targeted group economically disadvantaged or veteran-owned businesses in Senate File 3733 would give more flexibility to agencies, help grow the pool of vendors that do business with the state, and clarify procurement language. I do appreciate the inclusion of flexibility for buildings subject to the Sustainable Building 2030 requirements to use renewable energy generated off-site. The language in Senate File 3655 would complement these provisions by providing additional options for projects. And finally, the omnibus bill draft includes significant requirements for admin related to grant oversight. While the department is committed to working toward language that can be effectively implemented, the bill provides no funding to support the additional required duties. The oversight envisioned in that language cannot be effectively administered without additional capacity in the one person Office of Grants Management. Again, thank you for your consideration and I look forward to working with you throughout the committee bill process. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Next is Commissioner Showalter. Please introduce yourself for the record and begin your testimony. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, for the record, my name is Jim Showalter, Commissioner of Minnesota Management and Budget, and I appreciate the chance to address the committee today regarding uh, Senate File 3975. Uh, I want to just take a few minutes to provide some feedback to the committee, and I'll try to keep uh, my comments brief. Uh, as you know, uh, you know, MMB is uh, responsible uh, for the financial and human resources of the states making sure that we deliver effective services for the people of Minnesota. We're careful, we're 
competent, we're stewards of our public resources in a number of different ways. Uh, MMB is a central service agency with about 260 employees who serve the governor, the legislature, more than 100 state government agencies, and the workforce of the state of 56,000 employees, and most importantly, the public. When Senate File 3975 was released, I was looking forward to it. I was curious to see what was going to be in it, because we know there's a number of priorities that could be addressed uh, in the uh, go State Government Finance and Policy and Elections Committee. As I looked through the bill, unfortunately, I searched for proposals or issues that were put forward by MMB and found nothing. Unfortunately, not one of MMB's proposals or alternatives to proposals were included in 3975. Despite the shared responsibility that we all have, for improving state government, for improving state services, for continuing to evolve. 3975 does not address some key issues. And in particular, I wanted to draw out the critical funding shortfall for the state's enterprise resource planning systems. Deputy Commissioner Raytan and others have been in front of the committee and explained this in, in more specifics. But in summary, MMB owns the systems that make up our state's ERP technology. And employees in all three branches of the state government use these IT systems for the day-to-day -day operations. It costs more than $22 million each year for MMB to maintain, operate, and enhance these systems. MMB has only one dedicated funding source, the statewide systems account. And it uses that to pay for these costs. In other state statute, MMB can only bill state agencies $10 million annually for this account. $22 million in it costs, $10 million in billing, and we've then, then relied on basically between state appropriations, uh, one-time resources, and uh, things like these Odyssey funds to bridge that gap. It's been that way for a while, but unfortunately we're at a tipping point. And that's the message to the committee. The reserves in the statewide system account have been exhausted, and the account is projected to have a deficit in fiscal 23. Without basic maintenance being covered, our ability to improve it and provide basic services is, falls even further out of reach. For instance, data warehouse needs to be addressed, needs to be improved, and things like that cannot happen until we figure out what a, a good strategy is for financing uh, these uh, activities. I know, you know, as a head of an agency, you may say, well, it's Shell Walter coming from MMB saying that. I just want to then also direct you to the OLA report from 2018 which said that the legislature and MMB have a shared responsibility in finding a solution to this funding problem. The governor's budget has a solution. You've heard it. I'm going to not go into specifics about it, but the key thing is we had an idea to use some one-time resources to change the billing, to improve governance, to have a strategic vision and move us forward. I ask that this proposal be reconsidered and move forward because it's an important cornerstone for all of our activities. Uh, in addition, there were a number of other requests uh, evaluating impact of state investments, capital budget outreach, cross-agency coordination in the children's cabinet, cost of living adjustments for retirees. None of those are in the bill either. There's, in addition, there's a, a language provision, which I thought was pretty technical, about using allowable collateral for state's business banking process. Just want to draw that to your attention as well. That is not in the bill either. Finally, we're carrying a significant large request regarding $500 million flexible funds for COVID response. You know how we've used that in the past year, the importance of it in responding to a number of urgent needs, whether it was emergency nursing facility grants, emergency staff hospital decompression, emergency training and rapid at home tests. There are a lot of things that we did not know and anticipate last June, but the legislature had the foresight to put the money out in a flexible way so that we were able to respond to contingencies. And that is part of our request as well. And I want to draw it in uh, so that as you go forward to this as finance committee or as you review this bill before adoption, um, you consider these changes. I know targets are hard. $10 million only goes so far. I just want to remind you that last year, MMB helped return $310 million to the state because of its ability to use these systems to be a, a ability to finance state activities with federal dollars and leverage those dollars to the fullest extent. And so this is an opportunity for us to keep that going so that we not only har you know, harvest that opportunity from the past, but pay it forward as well. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Final testifier for the 
Uh, commissioners is John Eichten from Minute. Uh, members, you do have a letter from the commissioner directly. So, Mr. Eichten, it would be to amplify or supplement briefly. Mr. Eichten, please introduce yourself for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, for the opportunity to testify. For the record, my name is John Eichten. I'm Deputy Commissioner for Minnesota IT Services. Uh, earlier this year, we presented the governor's budget recommendations related to IT modernization, cybersecurity, and accessibility. Uh, the proposed change items for a minute that were included are intended to address increasingly urgent threats in the area of cybersecurity while making targeted investments in tech modernization at both the infrastructure and application level. Uh, Minnesotans expect government services that are secure, easy to access, and that promote the efficient delivery of services. Senate File 3975 fails to respond to these expectations and the demands of operating mission critical technology systems in the midst of a rapidly evolving cyber threat landscape. Uh, it does so by omitting the governor's proposed investments in IT modernization and security. As the state's IT agency, we want to register our serious concerns with the exclusion of these investments. Uh, over the past two years of the pandemic, we've witnessed the increasingly central role of technology in our daily lives and the need, need for rapid technology solution, solutioning when emergencies occur. We've also witnessed the continued evolution of cyber threats originating from criminal networks, nation states, and geopolitical conflicts. The significant technology debt that the state carries in the form of aging technology not only hampers effective and, and effective and efficient engagement with Minnesotans and, their, and our external partners, it also puts at risk the delivery of critical government services. Now is the time to address these threats and lay a modern technology foundation through targeted investments in an accelerated move to the cloud, application modernization, and the implementation of advanced cyber tools. The choice is clear. Minnesota can accept increasing cyber risk and the constraints that aging technology puts on our ability to innovate, or we can make a significant leap forward in securing and modernizing our technology environments, while at the same time transforming the way Minnesotans interact with their government. I want to specifically highlight uh, concerns with the omission in the bill of state matching dollars that are required to leverage $18 million in federal funds for the state and local cybersecurity. Mr. Eichten, Mr. Eichten, this is all in the document in front of us. I guess I would ask you, is there something you'd like to highlight as opposed to reading the document that's already been provided to the committee? Mr. Chair, thank you. I would, I would like to highlight uh, some concerns that haven't been raised previously related to the uh, election uh, streaming provisions of the bill. Uh, the bill is unclear to us in our reading as to who is actually serving as the data owner of the data that would be provided under that bill. Uh, it's important. A data owner provides the classification of the data, says what's private, what's not, what is public. Uh, the, we're unclear in the bill as well. It says the data in those videos would be public. We, are, we may redact or obscure private data. Uh, and the while the bill does fund to some degree the technology needs, it does not fund staff that would be needed to do that sort of review and redaction. Uh, in addition, it's, it's unclear in the bill uh, uh, what entity ultimately would be responding to public data requests uh, and facing any scrutiny as a result of private information that may be made available online. I'll abridge the rest of my testimony. Uh, we're committed to working with you and other members of this committee to enable uh, continued transformation of state services and to live up to our responsibilities as state leaders to protect Minnesotans and their data and the critical services upon which they rely. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Eichten. Uh, there are seven testifiers left on the, on the list. There are 21 minutes. I think even I can do the division on that one. Uh, so we have three minutes per testifier. Uh, if you see me hold up a gavel, that means you have 15 seconds left. So we do want to make sure that everybody gets in and gets in before we run out of time. First, right now on the list is Alex Hassel from the League of Minnesota Cities, followed by Matt Hilgert. Uh, for Association of Minnesota Counties. Hi, Alex. I see Alex, introduce yourself for the record. Begin your testimony. Thank you, Chair Osmick and member of the, members of the committee for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Alex Hassel. I'm with the League of Minnesota Cities, representing 837 cities across the state of Minnesota. 
There are a few sections of this bill that I would like to comment on, but I'll begin with the elections provisions in Article 3 of the bill. I'd first like to thank Chair Kiffmeyer for the time that she, her staff, and council have spent with local governments and elections administrators to discuss elections legislation this session. We greatly appreciate Chair Kiffmeyer's time and receptiveness to some of the challenges this legislation would impose. While we cannot ultimately support some of the policies in this bill, we do recognize the efforts that have been made to make them more feasible to administer, including providing language for a state contract and funding for the ballot markings required in Section 20, providing funding and statewide assistance and management of all data and IT requirements in this proposal, which is substantial, and including language to allow alternative video recording options in the event that a live stream may be disrupted to prevent delayed election results. As noted from our previous testimony, we continue to have concerns regarding the need for additional staff and training to uh, ensure compliance. The new ballot board observer role, which we thought could provide, it, provide an alternative to ballot board live streaming, but under the current proposal would be a both and proposal that creates additional logistical and privacy concerns. The limiting of additional absentee polling places to those open all 46 days of absentee voting and the limitations on the flexibility of ballot drop boxes, both of these last points limiting the ability of local jurisdictions to ramp up the elections efforts where and when it may make sense best for their community. These are, however, there are, however, several provisions that we do support. We support the language in section 32 of the bill to simplify the sample ballot information required to be published for each election, which will reduce voter confusion and ensure that voters who would like a sample ballot receive one specific to their address. We also support the language in section 35 to require that absentee ballot applications and sample ballots provided by non-government organizations include a statement that it is not an official elections communication. In addition to the elections provisions of the bill, there are two other sections I would like to point on on behalf of the League. Under Article 2, Section 8 of the bill, a nonprofit organization that has a local elected official on their board would be ineligible to receive state grant funding. While we do not have an official position on this, we do not understand why local elected officials would be included in the provision as they do not have jurisdiction over state grant awards. We would like to point out that many local elected officials across the state do serve their communities by sitting on boards, which can range uh, from anywhere from a church council, food, food shelf, fire relief association, um, and many more that might occasionally be the beneficiary of state funds. The last provision I will point to your attention is Article 2, Section 12, which would provide flexibility to address the financial challenges we expect to see from additional costs being added to the workers' compensation system through PTSD presumptions. This will provide latitude to invest in the longer term to cover those long-term liabilities. We support this provision and thank you for including it in the bill. And with that, I will conclude my testimony. Thank you. Mr. Hilgard, please uh, introduce yourself for the record and begin your testimony. And thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Matt Hilgard, and I represent the Association of Minnesota Counties. AMC represents all of Minnesota's 87 counties. And I will try not to echo what Ms. Hassel just stated. Um, we do have similar questions to LMC regarding the grants to nonprofits. We went through our 100-plus uh, year history, and I think we've identified two that we've ident indirectly had, one regarding responding to uh, past and present uh, emergencies, and um, one also with juvenile detention alter alternatives initiatives. For us, we have a board entirely composed of elected county commissioners, so this would be something that we'd have some questions on. I want to thank Senator Kiffmeyer for including the investment authority piece in Article 2, Section 12 as well as calling to attention an important issue regarding remonumentation. These public land survey monuments are essential for all property descriptions, location of infrastructure, and accurate geospatial uh, in infrastructure. So we really appreciate uh, that inclusion. Uh, regarding the elections article, Article 3, um, we still have concerns about the expedited timeline to enter voter registration applications. Um, and share LMC comments regarding constricting the flexibility of drop boxes. I will pause to kind of note that the live streaming requirements are fairly significant changes to election policy. And I still don't uh, see a clear sense of what happens if someone drops more than one ballot. There's a stop sign in the, or there's a stop sign that's on the drop box ballot box at the moment, but it's unclear if we catch someone on live streaming that dropped more than one, what are our responsibilities as city or county officers? What happens to that person who dropped more than one ballot? Um, we are extremely grateful for Senator Kiffmeyer's change to, for all data responsibilities to be to minute. I was taking notes as Mr. Eichten testified today because it is our assumption 
um, that these responsibilities would fall entirely within minute. We simply do not have the capacity uh, as local election administrators across all 87 counties to take on these duties. Um, and lastly, the ballot observer role. Uh, there were several changes that Senator Kiffmeyer made um, from the most recent draft we saw in her committee. Uh, we appreciate the changes made to amplify training for this new role. We appreciate um, also taking the right away to record themselves during this time and the flexibility uh, to county officials if the stream is disrupted. We still have concerns over the four feet um, measure that is still in the language. And lastly, similar to LMC, we are grateful for the added transparency uh, for labeling non-governmental mailings containing absentee ballot applications. And I'd, I'd want to call light to a new provision included in the draft, which is the attempt to modernize sample ballot requir uh, requirement publications. Uh, that has been in effect for several decades, and we are thankful for Senator Kiffmeyer's efforts on that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. H uh, Mr. Hilgert. Uh, next up is Max Hilprin followed by Les Heen. Mr. Halpern, please introduce yourself for the record, begin your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, I am Max Halpern, testifying as an individual. Article 3, Section 8 provides that all data in the statewide voter registration system be public, aside from some specific uh, exceptions. And when that language was previously heard by this committee, there wasn't any discussion of the fact that over a million individuals have data in that system without being registered voters. Those people fall into several categories, which I could go into uh, were their time and interest. Um, I will say that the, one of the very smallest categories was brought up and that's minors whose uh, voter registration applications are pending until they turn 18. And with regard to that particular group, the Civil Law and Data Practices Committee crafted a phrase that specifies that any identifying information related to a minor be private. And I think that's very valuable and what I would like to uh, point out is that similar privacy concerns uh, apply also for other people uh, who are not registered voters, in particular because anyone who's not a registered voter can't avail themselves of the one safeguard that's in the bill, which is that a registered voter can specify if they have a fear for their personal safety or that of a family member that their data be kept private. And since that's not available if you're not a registered voter, what I would respectfully urge is that this committee build on the work that civil law did, take that phrase and broaden it so that instead of merely saying that any identifying information related to a minor is private, it say any identifying information related to an individual who is not a registered voter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Next is Mr. Heen, followed by Annie Shapiro. Mr. Heen, introduce yourself for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, my name is Les Heen. I'm with the Libby Law Office and representing the Friends of Minnesota Public Television. And my comments today are limited to uh, Section 8 and the nonprofit grant requirements. At the Minnesota Public Television stations, we appreciate and support the need for accountability and transparency. As such, we submit already annual independent audits to the state, and we have done so for decades. We also submit proof that we are maintaining federal broadcast licenses and meet the strict grant eligibility requirements of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. We believe in accountability. We also, in our annual state grant reporting, already do accounting for how funds are spent and extensive reporting on outcomes, particularly for legacy fund grants. Our concerns with Section 8 are twofold. Our first concern is the restriction on compensation. Public television stations compete for the best talent in the nation in a national market, and as a result, we need the flexibility to pay to attract the best talent in the nation. We produce award-winning stories about Minnesotans because of the talented people at our stations, and we oppose, therefore, the comp compensation limits in Subdivision 2. 
Our second concern is with the prohibition on board membership for state employees or elected officials. Public television stations have an educational mission, and for that reason, we have had a state college or university employees from time to time on our public television boards. And we know that rural stations in particular may also have local elected officials, such as small town city council members or township officers, on boards or as employees. Therefore, we oppose these restrictions on board membership or employees. Those are our two concerns with the bill, and I thank you for the opportunity to testify today. And you came in in under two minutes. Congratulations, you're currently the leader. Um, next is Ann Shapiro, followed by Marie Ellis. Ms. Shapiro, please introduce yourself for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Chair, members. My name is Annie Shapiro. I'm the Advocacy Director at the Minnesota Community Action Partnership. I'm here today to raise concerns about Article 2, Section 8 of Senate File 3975, which prohibits nonprofits with elected officials on their boards from receiving state funds. MNCAP represents the 24 community action agencies across the state, which provide services in all 87 counties. According to federal law, community action agencies are mandated to have tripartite boards, meaning that one third of every community action agency board must be comprised of local elected officials. We are concerned this provision would have unintended negative consequences for Minnesota's community action network, as it would prevent community action agencies from being eligible to receive state grants and funding. Community action agencies provide a variety of services in local communities across the state, from housing to food access and nutrition, to older adult services, to transportation, to employment and training, and just to name a few. In many parts of the state, community action agencies are the only agencies providing services for low-income Minnesotans, and a significant percentage of community action agency funding comes from the state. I urge you to reconsider Article 2, Section 8, Subsection 2 of Senate File 3975, the negative impact of this provision for community action agencies and for low-income Minnesotans across the state would be great. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Shapiro. You've now achieved first place. <laughs> Next is Marie Ellis. Please introduce yourself for the record and begin your testimony, followed by Katrina Mortensen. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Marie Ellis. I'm the Public Policy Director at the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits. I'm here to talk about what uh, some previous testifiers have already talked about, and so I will try to skip some portions of my planned testimony. Um, I'm also here to talk about Article 2, Section 8, and ask that you remove that from the omnibus bill. Uh, Minnesota Council of Nonprofits, I should add, represents over 2,000 nonprofits all across the state. It seems like the goal of this language is to weed out any bad actors that are looking to scam the partnership between the state and nonprofits. And we are absolutely on board with that goal because trust of the public is entirely essential to our ability to operate and advance our emissions. And so we welcome conversation on how current controls can be enhanced. However, this legislation is not a result of those conversations. It's a blanket approach that would affect all tax-exempt entities in the state with new layers of unnecessary oversight and restrictions. The charitable nonprofit sector is the most transparent sector of the United States economy. Each year, we publicly disclose our revenues, expenses, salaries, and more through the IRS Form 990, which is publicly available online through at least eight free public websites, including Economic Research Institute and GuideStar. You can also find an overview of an organization's financial health very easily on the Minnesota Attorney General's website. Two specific issues I'll highlight. One is the compensation cap that's already been discussed. It's very broad, not clear what's included, uh, and like every other sector, we need experienced and talented leaders and staff. We need to compensate appropriately in the labor market. If a legislator or a state agency has concerns that an organization they're considering contracting with is paying compensation beyond market value, you can look at those publicly available IRS Form 990 filings, which always include the five highest compensated employees that make over $100,000 in annual compensation. Compensation beyond market value will be a clear red flag for the granting agency. Second, as you've heard, this language dictates who can and cannot serve on nonprofit boards. We encourage nonprofits to connect with just the, some of the pools of people who would be ineligible um, because they're often the most civic-minded and interested board members. It would also prohibit people with certain convictions from serving on nonprofit boards. Nonprofits need to be able to determine the best board members for their organization. We benefit from people with varied lived experiences serving on our boards. 
And finally, this language was introduced last week, Tuesday, and it had a committee hearing the following morning. It's been less than one week that stakeholders have had any indication that this legislation was coming, much less time to consider the consequences, connect with the bill author, you all, and other stakeholders. Thank you for the opportunity to speak in opposition to Article 2, Section 8. We ask that you remove that from your bill. Thank you. Final testifier is Katrina Mortensen. <laughs> Please identify, identify yourself for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Katina Mortensen, and I'm the Director of Public Policy at the Minnesota Council on Foundations. We represent Minnesota philanthropy and have more than 150 foundations in our membership across the state, granting more than $2 billion um, to nonprofits annually. I am here today to voice our concern about the section in the omnibus bill related to grants to nonprofit organizations, Article 2, Section 8. As grant makers, our members know that federal regulations and standards already exist around nonprofit compensation. Boards must consider comparative data in making CEO salary decisions and must transparently include salaries over $100,000 in the Form 990 tax form that's publicly available. Nonprofit boards seriously consider salary decisions and must offer detailed information and justification for salaries in Schedule J of the Form 990. As grant makers, we feel that these federal regulations and standards provide oversight and guardrails around nonprofit compensation, while ensuring nonprofits can be competitive with their peers in this state and across the country when attracting talent. We do not think the state needs to add a nonprofit salary provision tied to the governor's salary when there is already a federal process and the 990 tax form to regulate and understand nonprofit salaries. It is also worth mentioning that some of our members, community foundations, and grant making public charities, are the types of nonprofits that can serve as important partners to state government in distributing state and federal funds. For example, several of our members have partnered with DEED in administering and serving as intermediaries for the small business relief programs or the Main Street Economic Revitalization grants and loans. Our members aim to be good partners with government and leverage their grant making expertise to support state efforts. Often these are programs where the state does not have the staff capacity, community connections, or grant making expertise to administer these programs on their own. A salary cap at the governor's salary could make it difficult to, for some of our members to retain and attract top talent and could have the unintended impact of leaving government with fewer intermediary partners for these types of programs. Minnesota philanthropy also has concerns about the constraints this bill places on state employees and elected officials from serving on boards. It is our view that diverse boards strengthen a nonprofit, and we know that state employees and elected officials can be valued board members, and we feel that our state's nonprofit sector would be hurt by excluding their participation. In summary, we have some significant concerns about these provisions related to grants to nonprofit organizations, and we would encourage this section be removed from the omnibus bill. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and bring the perspective of Minnesota philanthropy to the committee today. Senator Kiffmeyer, now you understand why Senator Fishbach used to say I run a tight ship. We have <laughs> two, about two minutes for you to do any cl closing statements before we adjourn and come back tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Chair of this committee. I will absolutely take that to heart. And to mention, members, that I have taken notes here on everybody who has testified. I consider all of their comments carefully uh, for any future actions. Uh, in regards to the nonprofits, I think it's important to add additional information that on a bipartisan, bicameral fashion from the House and Senate, these grants to nonprofits are a big topic. And three of them uh, were taken in the vote of the legislature. That's how important it is to them and how serious this area is and the concerns that legislators have on a bipartisan House and Senate basis. And I think it's important for our nonprofits to take that to heart, that um, there are concerns and there are issues here that I think are important. Is this the exact right way to deal with it? I took a solution that was offered because I wanted to hear the testimony, and that is what we have heard here today. And I welcome any suggestions and ideas or language that they have to target the effectiveness. I'd also like to mention there are many, commissioners included, that are tied to the governor's salary that seem to be competent people. 
And so I think that when we have nonprofits, and the whole point of this is nonprofits, charitable, I think it's very important to consider that their positions of leadership uh, not just be allowed to uh, take funds that might otherwise go to the purpose of the nonprofit. And I, those are the, my comments, Mr. Chair, that I would just add in addition today to um, things. And Mr. Chair, for tomorrow, I will be taking um, amendments and comments and so on from committee members, and then there will be a vote uh, from this committee to move the bill on to the Finance Committee. With that, Mr. Chair, that concludes my comments on this bill today, and it would be laid over for uh, action tomorrow. Senate file uh, 3975, as amended, is hereby laid on the table and picked up tomorrow. And no, seeing no further uh, items on the agenda, this committee is adjourned.